Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Um, the plan was I was also going to be welcoming um, James Tredgett uh, here, who was going to be leading our service. Um, unfortunately, he uh, and his family are, are ill. Um, we discovered yesterday afternoon they're not able uh, to come along, um, which also means the um, evangelism training and, and the door-to-door stuff we were going to do, also we will postpone for another occasion. We'll try and get um, James back. But we do still have lunch. So, um, and in terms of what we're doing today, um, some of you may recognize this message. It's actually something I did three years ago, um, which I'm sure you remember totally, um, those of you that were here. And, but it was something that was never recorded. So um, I've always sort of intended to sort of redo it in some form. And this was sort of forced uh, upon me yesterday. So that's what we have for today. Um, for our, our meetings this week, we have um, our prayer meeting back in the chapel here at 7.30 on Wednesday. And then a reminder, next Sunday uh, is a baptismal service. Um, Divine is being uh, baptized. And um, let's be praying for her through this week. And we also have our five o'clock meeting next Sunday. But let's begin with um, this great hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, um, a hymn written by uh, the German Joachim Neander, who I, I, I have to always um, mention this because there was a valley in Germany named after him, and this was the valley in which centuries or a century later or so, the fossils were found of the things that we call Neanderthals, um, which contrary to common opinion were not brutish oafs, they were human beings like us. They were part of the same human family. In fact, most of us here have Neanderthal DNA in us. Um, they include people for whom Christ died. So um, I, I love, I just think it's great the way he had this valley named after him with these, um, these human fossils. But anyway, um, let's stick to the hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
Well, as we come to prayer, let's uh, read these words from Paul's letter to the Colossians. This is speaking of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he goes on to say, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Jesus, our creator and our redeemer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are not an, an, in an impersonal, purposeless universe. We're not in a place where events just happen, where we are just part of some vast machine. We thank you rather that you are the creator. You are the God who has made everything. You have made us that you are someone who cares, who provides, who reigns. You rule over this creation. And we thank you that you're a God that is not just vast in power. You're a God that we can know. A God who has ma you've made us in your image that we might know you. And you've made yourself known in Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we see Jesus Christ, we see the human face of God. He is the Almighty God. He is the one who has made us. He is the one who rules this world today, who upholds everything. Without his will, nothing would exist. We thank you that this whole world in the end is for him. And we exist today because of Jesus Christ, of his will. And we thank you that his love is seen supremely in how he has come into this world, how he has come to save. We thank you that he took on our humanity. We thank you that he came into the world as it is now, into a suffering world, a sinful world, a world of cruelty and violence. And we thank you that he was ready to suffer the effects of that, even to go to the cross, to be unjustly executed, to suffer and to die. And we thank you that he has risen again. We thank you that he has ascended to your right hand. We thank you that he is still, um, in, the, in this resurrected human body, he reigns today. And we thank you that he is coming back. We thank you that we will all see him. And Lord, as we recount this, this glorious reality of, of, of the past, the present, and the future that centers on Jesus Christ, may we see that he is the person who connects with our daily lives. Lord, you know how we've come here this morning. You know the different things on our hearts the different things that concern us, that perhaps are making us afraid or downcast or joyful. You know, Lord, the, what we're thinking about. And we pray, Father, that this morning that we would truly understand that Jesus is the answer to all our need. He is the one who is not in some separate category to all our normal daily life, but he is the one who is Lord over everything. He is the answer to our lostness, to our guilt, to our disappointment. And we thank you too, he is the answer to the physical struggles that we face, even um, as our bodies don't work as we would like, as we face uh, a creation that is out of sorts, a creation that is decaying, as we, all of us, are heading in the end to death. We, pr we thank you that Jesus is the answer to all of these things. And we pray, Father, that we would know what it is to trust him today, to 
live out what it truly means that Jesus is Lord in our daily lives. Heavenly Father, make, make the glory and the wonder and the grandeur of your salvation clear to us today. And may each one of us trust in Jesus for ourselves, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, let's go now to um, our reading uh, from Romans. Um, let's pray this won't be on the screen this morning. This was all hurriedly put together. So it gives us a great opportunity to open um, a Bible, which means you've then got it ready to follow along later on. And it's on page 797 in the church Bibles. And um, this this three things or people that are groaning in this passage. I wonder if you can, you can spot that as we read through here. Paul here is speaking to the Christians in Rome in verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God, our children, then we are heirs, co-heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we e wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So what are the three people or things that are groaning? Does anyone spot any of those? The creation is groaning. Thank you. In verse 22. What about in verse 23? Thank you. It's Christians are groaning. Yeah. Um, and then in verse 26, the, the Spirit, God the Spirit is groaning um, in our prayers. So we'll have to think about, well, now and later on, um, what, what that uh, groaning is about. But um, let me, let me um, I've said things are in, in a rush. Well, here's, um, here's, here's a picture I've, um, I'm very proud of that I've taken great care in drawing. I wonder what you, what you think of this, my, my great bit of artwork here. Now imagine, what are you laughing at? That's, 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 not, very, that's not very nice, right. Um, now imagine... Someone thought, I don't know why they would ever think that, well, this is a bit rubbish, you know, <laughs> who cares, let's just scribble all over it. What would we do? What would I do to my, uh, to my precious picture? 
Well, I think if you've got any sense, you would throw it away because actually it's not that precious. It's not actually that great a picture. You're, you're right to laugh. You'd throw it away. It's not worth anything. It's not valuable. So, what about if we went to the Louvre in Paris and we came across this painting, which is perhaps the most pa famous painting in the world, the Mona Lisa? And what if someone did this? Um, maybe wanted to brighten it up a bit, add a bit of colour in her cheeks. What do we do? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? You're going to take it off the wall and stick it in the bin. No? Why not? Be because it's, uh, it's still a piece of artwork. It is something so precious and valuable that you're not going to throw it away. You're going to do whatever you can to restore it. There's all sorts of clever ways you can try and remove the pen marks or the paint or whatever else um, someone might have put on this painting. You're going to try and get it back to the original. And you do that because the picture is so valuable. So even though it's spoiled like that, it's still a masterpiece. And so you want to restore it back to what it was before. Well, think about something that's even more uh, impressive, even more artistic. What about this whole universe that God has made? This whole planet? Think about all the different scenery we can see. Think about all the different animals. Think about all the, the stars in the sky. Think how incredible this creation is that God has made. But if you're honest, if you also look at this creation, you see things that are not so attractive. You see a lot of violence. You see a lot of disease. You see a lot of pain and suffering and danger. And things die, don't they? It's a world that's in a constant cycle of death. And the world as we see it now is not how God originally made it. It is spoiled. It is spoiled because of human sin. We're going to be thinking about that more. I mean, it was there in our reading. We're going to be thinking about that more uh, later on. It isn't functioning as God originally intended. So what does God do with this amazing creation he's made? Well, you might think, well, I'll give up on this. You know, forget this creation thing. This, this didn't work out. This has been spoilt. Just get rid of it all. That's actually how a lot of Christians think, but it's wrong. And it's wrong because it's so precious. This is what God has made. He isn't going to throw it away, just as we wouldn't throw away the Mona Lisa. He's going to restore creation. He's going to redeem it. He's going to bring it back. He's going to restore it, and in fact, restore it to something even better than the original. And that is all something that Jesus came to do. And the first step of that was actually Jesus rising from the dead. You know, I said that the problem with creation is things die. We die. Well, Jesus is the first person who conquered death. He died as we die. But he rose to a life that none of us have yet experienced. He rose to this new resurrection life, never to die again. And that is going to be completed when he comes again when those who trust him will share in, also have that resurrection body and share in a whole new creation where God's going to put everything back together again. So if you get lost later on, in this, that's basically what I'm trying to say, okay, um, in the, the, the message later on. So God doesn't give up on us, and he doesn't give up on us as people. We've all sinned, we've all messed up, in very big ways in our lives. But God doesn't give up. He could give up on us. He could say, well, forget it. I've given you everything. I've given you everything you need. You've turned away from me. Forget it. I'm out of here. I don't, I don't care. God could rightly do that. But he doesn't. He doesn't give up on us. And he sends us a saviour so that we 
can be forgiven and share in this whole new purpose that God has for us. And we see the beginnings of that when Jesus came for the first time. We're going to sing this song now. Who spoke words of wisdom and life? Who performed miraculous signs, healed the sick, gave sight to the blind? Those are things that have gone wrong. Those are things that are not how God made the world in the beginning. But Jesus comes to undo those. And so there, in, even in his first coming, he's doing that work of undoing the problem of sin. And we see that as we go through this, um, this chorus together. And, uh, and after we've sung this, Simon's going to come up and lead us uh, in prayer. But let's, let's stand and sing this together. Who spoke words of wisdom and life? Well, just before we, uh, <coughs> before we pray, um, I just wanted to remind folk of the, the regular pattern of our meetings that we're trying to establish here at the church. So you can see there, hopefully, on the screen. My screen's gone blank, I'm afraid, but uh, I can see it down here on the laptop. Um, first Sunday, that was last week, the Lord's Supper with a discussion meeting. The second Sunday in the month, that's this week today we're having lunch and uh, if you've come unprepared or if you'd forgotten that it was lunch please please stay if you can and so we can enjoy fellowship um, next Sunday um, Stephen's already mentioned the baptismal service but also then in the afternoon there is a discussion meeting at five o'clock where we'll discuss some of the things that we've looked at in the sermons and in the um, the, the weeks that have gone past. And then this fourth Sunday, and also I guess if there happens to be a fifth Sunday in the month, um, it's a chance to be a bit innovative and, and to sort of look for ways for us all to meet together. I know that there is a, uh, a group already sort of meeting for those who are sort of young adults, um, but there are other groups as well. There are other uh, ways in which we can enjoy 
um, one another's fellowship and build our, our church together um, and look for ways to do that. So that's uh, just a recap of where we are. Um, I wonder if you <coughs> um, use hymns at all to help you with your praying and help you with your devotional life. And there's a hymn that uh, we sang at the, um, the meeting in Bromley a couple of weeks ago. And just some of the words there, um, I, I love this hymn, but um, they just help us uh, when we come to prayer. Um, it goes something like this. I, I might get some of the words wrong, but it's, Before the throne above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest... That's Jesus, whose name is love, whoever lives and, uh, and intercedes for me. And then we get those times, those dark times sometimes, when prayer seems hard and we're discouraged. And there's another verse that says, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. So we can come to we can come to God through Christ because he has made an end of all our sin. He's dealt with it. And whatever Satan may whisper in our ear, we can still come to God and be freely accepted because, we, because the gospel is a gospel of grace. So let's come to him and pray. <clears throat> Oh Lord God, we, we give you thanks this morning for the access that we have into the very presence of the, the throne room of God. And we thank you that we come to God the Father through God the Son. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he ever lives and intercedes on our behalf. We thank you for the Spirit of God who indwells every single one of us who are believers this morning, uh, who helps us in our praying and helps us as we, as we come to you. And we ask for the Spirit's help this morning, that our prayers might be real and sincere as we come to you, as we seek to enter your presence, uh, not standing in our own merits or supposed goodness, but uh, clothed in a righteousness which is not our own. The righteousness which has been given to us freely by Christ. We thank you that we are accepted in heaven this morning uh, in, in Christ. And as much as Christ is accepted in heaven this morning. And so we thank you that our prayers are, are heard. There is a guarantee of them being heard uh, as we come in this way. And Lord, we, we thank you uh, for the, the way in which we can gather together to worship you. That we're not only meeting in our own homes uh, on our own, perhaps with the Bible and uh, our, our, uh, our own prayers. But we thank you, Lord, that we can gather together and we can hear your word being read and we can hear you speaking through that reading. We thank you as well that uh, you have gifted uh, people in, the, in, the, in your church. We, you, you've given us uh, a, a preacher, You've given us someone who is able to open up the word and explain the word of God to us. Lord, we read in the scriptures, uh, in the Psalms, how um, the psalmist treasured your word. He, he delighted in your testimonies, how he, um, he regarded your word as his counsellor. And Lord, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you that we have a Bible to read uh, a Bible to understand and treasure and obey. And Lord, we, we pray for our, uh, our brother Stephen as he uh, stands now, um, uh, or very shortly, to open up your word to us. Um, 
given very short notice today because of um, James not being well. And we pray, Lord, that you would help Stephen um, as he opens up your word to explain it well and to know how to um, put this across to us so that we can understand it. And uh, as we mentioned James, we also pray for him. We ask, Lord, that as he's unwell, that you would soon restore him and his family, who are all uh, unwell apparently. We pray for them all, that you would give uh, restoration of health very soon. And we pray that you would bless him in his ministry um, as he seeks to share your word in, in many different ways and with many different people day by day. Lord, we also remember um, Adam uh, Lawton and Julia as they're away, uh, as Adam's preaching uh, elsewhere today. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, bless, bless them as they open up your word to the congregation there in Tunbridge. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, guide Adam and Julia uh, as they uh, seek your, um, your leading for the future and for their ministry. We remember those that we uh, support uh, who are uh, missionaries in, in different areas of the world. We think of Ru our brother Roop in, in India uh, planting a church, planting two churches. Lord, we thank you that you've given him gifts, you've given him enthusiasm for the Lord and that you've given him um, that ability to get alongside people and uh, explain spiritual things. Lord, bless his work. And we think of uh, Maxim and Demelza in Bordeaux and, and Ben and Enna in Mostar. And we pray, Lord, that um, whatever ministry they're involved in today, you would bless, bless their work. Lord, we, we long for the word of God, the truth about God, to be broadcast in our own nation. Lord, we, we, we see so little of the truth being honoured or proclaimed or believed. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us, each one of us, in our own way to, um, to be spreaders of the word. Uh, Lord, we pray for these streets uh, round about this chapel uh, that we were going to visit today. And we pray that in the coming days we might um, be able to, to do this once again and uh, knock on doors and say hello to the folk who live round this chapel but probably know nothing about what happens here. And we pray that uh, you would be at work in advance of our calling on their door, that you would be wor working in hearts and minds, giving them a, a hunger for reality, a hunger for truth, a hunger for finding out about the true God. Lord, we do pray that you would help us as you've commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Lord, we also uh, just pause for a moment and remember uh, folk in our congregation who may not be feeling well, who uh, may have distractions on their hearts, on their minds. And Lord, we do pray that each one of us whether in this room or whether listening later on a broadcast or uh, whether part of our church but um, away from us at the moment. We pray, Lord, meet with them all and deal with them in their souls. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to uh, stand and sing our next hymn. Joy to the world, the Lord has come.
Well, I'm sure that you recall that on uh, the 15th of June, 1989, there was a, an election for the European Parliament. Um, it was my 18th birthday. Um, I was, as of that day, entitled to vote, so I did. Um, and there's only time I'll tell you what I voted for. I voted green. And I'll leave it to you to work out whether that was a good thing to do. But on that day, another 2 million people did. It was actually about 15% of the votes. Um, it was actually the, the best ever result in a national election for the Green Party. And that was back in 1989. So all this sort of talk of green issues, don't think of this as being a new thing. It's all, all a bit passe. It's all been done before. Okay, it was back, back, back then in the, the late 80s. But it has become increasingly a moral issue for us today. I think there's a slight change in this. It's now, um, if you're not protecting the planet, if you're not doing your bit to combat climate change or whatever else, you are a bad person. This is a, an issue of morality. It's a big issue in schools today. It's our job to save the planet. Um, you get children's books like this, Saving the Earth, 100 Facts About Saving the Earth. This is, this is your job. This is your responsibility. This is what you should be doing um, as a child and, indeed, as an adult. You know, exam questions now often are about environmental concerns. World leaders listen with almost reverence to a teenage activist on these issues. A climate emergency has been declared such that you get 40,000 people gathering in Glasgow last year to address these issues. It's that important. But what do we say as Christians? Is this just an irrelevance? Do we stand back? Have we got nothing to say? Is it, well, we need to focus on, on the spiritual things, the spiritual issues, you know, let, let the world burn, if you like. It's not going to last, so, so what does it matter? Let, let's focus on what's really important, the spiritual stuff. Well, a lot of Christians speak like that, but I think it's profoundly wrong. I want to show you that God is very concerned for our physical world. And indeed, it is part of the rescue, the salvation, the rescue of Jesus Christ. Because after all, at the very center of Christianity, what do we have? We have the Son of God, Jesus Christ, becoming flesh. That is utterly unique amongst any religion. The way in Christianity you have the physical and the spiritual coming together in perfect harmony. And we see that supremely in Jesus Christ. So if you think we shouldn't be concerned about the physical world, I don't understand what on earth you do with Jesus Christ. There couldn't be anyone more physical than that. And as Christians, our spiritual life is lived out in physical bodies in a physical world. What we read there in Romans 8, we've, we read about uh, being God's children, that uh, we have God's spirit in us, this spirit of sonship. That's a very spiritual thing, but it talks about the, um, the suffering we then can undergo as Christians. Well, that is something very physical. And this whole idea of, of glory, sharing in glory, that is actually a very physical thing, the sort of glory that's being talked about here. Jesus' resurrection body was a body of glory. It's not something where you get rid of the physical, that's what's glory. No, no, no. The, the glory includes the physical. And the whole answer to the, the pain and the suffering and the problems in verse 23 is the redemption of our bodies. And in the meantime, you've got this talk of groaning. Well, what do you groan about? What do you pray for? Well, isn't it so often physical things? One of the first things we pray for is our bodies, isn't it? that they don't work as we would want them to. None of us is totally happy with our body, are we? How it functions, how it looks. And think about what occupies our time. 
well, we, we need to eat, don't we? We spend time shopping. We spend time preparing food. We work. We have our paid jobs. There's other sorts of works. We clean. We garden. We organize. We travel. Well, that can cause some groaning, can't it? We live together with other physical people and all that that entails. We live alongside the whole physical creation and animals. And we sleep, we rest, we exercise, we're seeking ways to care for our bodies. So we are, our daily lives are a, are a physical life, and that is where we live out our Christian obedience. And it means that when we are talking about uh, the environment, it isn't something that's sort of separate to us, that's sort of out there. We are part of it. And I'm sort of emphasizing the body here, because... The, our bodies is, is, if you like, the bit of creation the Bible, I think, talks about most. And I think the way that we should care for our bodies is actually a great pattern for how we should care for the world. And so what I want us to just do this morning is see something of God's vision for creation, a vision that is far better than <coughs> anything you're going to get from any environmental group, and actually far more radical than something like Extinction Rebellion. I mean, they're, they're really tame compared to the incredible things that God is talking about here in God's incredible plan. <clears throat> and it begins from understanding that we are in a created world. This isn't just a world that has just appeared out of nowhere with no one behind it. Verse 19, the creation waits well, if there's a creation, it means there's a creator. We've been made by God and for God. <clears throat> and it means this creation belongs to him. And if you like, it's his gift to us. Life is a gift. You know, so almost the first reason, why should we care about creation? Well, it's because it belongs to God and it's precious to God. It's almost a bit like someone... Um, saying that you can have a free run of their sports car or something. You know, something that's precious to them, and they're letting you drive it. Well, you would sort of take care of that, wouldn't you? You, would, you? you wouldn't think, oh, this doesn't matter. This is something precious to them. But if you were to ask some of the sort of environmental activists, the very simple question, why? It's actually a very good question to ask. You know, why? should we care for creation? Why should we bother about any of these things? I'm not sure there's any real answer. I mean, I guess you can say, well, we want to survive. But, but so what? Who cares whether we survive at one level? And actually, we do all sorts of things in our lives that don't help our survival, so why worry about the planet? You know, we do all sorts of things to our bodies that don't help our survival, so why worry about the planet? You see, if, the, if there is no God, if there is no creator, the world just is. What happens today is just the next thing that the, the cycle of all the laws of physics will bring to us. You can't say what is good or bad for the environment, because that implies there's some sort of purpose or some sort of plan. But it's just events that happen. The world constantly changes. Species go extinct. There's disasters. So what? You can't say that there's something wrong that needs fixing. And I think it's, it's a great question to ask when people raise these issues. Well, why? Why should we do that? As Christians, we have an answer. I'm not sure anyone else does. C.S. Lewis put it like this in a poem. He said, in this way of thinking, goodness is simply what comes next. It's just the next thing that the laws of nature bring up. We have a better story. Cre the created world is part of a plan, and we're not going to go through this passage in detail, but a, a very sort of, um, sort of surface reading, it is clear that God has a purpose for creation. He's talking about um, what has happened to creation in the past, that it's been subjected to frustration. It's talking about creation in its present state, that it's sort of groaning, that there's something wrong. And he's talking about a future of creation, this hope that the creation is hoping for this, for this liberation and for this rescue. In other words, it's going somewhere. There's a plan. 
So creation is not just a sort of a scenery or backdrop for the real spiritual work of salvation. That, that sort of God's plan is we have this sort of, you know, physical state for a while, but the real aim is, is something spiritual. Not at all. God's plan of salvation includes creation. He loves creation. So the God who made the world enters the world. Jesus Christ became part of the creation he had made. That's just incredible. The baby that was born in Bethlehem was the same person who made the entire universe and also the same person who was upholding the entire universe, even there as a baby. Incredible. And Jesus was raised from the dead with a body. Why bother with a body? Because God had a plan for the physical world. He ascended to heaven in a body. And he has a body today in heaven. And he's going to return. We're going to see this same Jesus with a body. That shows God's commitment to creation. You see it also in um, Noah's flood. Have you ever thought it was actually rather strange what God did there? You know, you've got all this problem with sin in the world. You've got Noah and his family as the only sort of righteous family left. Well, the obvious thing to do is to whisk Noah and his family off to some sort of spiritual existence in heaven and just destroy the world and be done with it. That would be the obvious thing to do, wouldn't it? But it isn't what God does. Rather, he preserves Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark. And yes, there's a destruction of the world, but it's to remake the world. God still has a plan for creation. And it's a plan that's better than any international committee could come up with. And and why does it matter so much to God? Well, creation reflects God's glory. We see God's goodness in the very good world he made at the beginning. He makes a world, we see something of what God is like. We see a world of beauty and of life, of order and of diversity. And in a way, you need the whole range of creation to properly reflect God in his fullness. You've got the sort of vastness of space, how tiny we are compared to the the vastness of the the distances of space and the, the, the myriads of stars. And yet, God also is, is the God of the microscopic. As you go into the to the world that's too small for us to see. And as you look at all the relationships between the different animals and how they work together and the, and the whole ecosystem and everything, it's just incredible, the different types of life that God makes. The weird animals that there are. None of this is random. They're all reflecting God in different ways. You know, trees and animals can be made of the same atoms, but they're They have different functions. They're put together differently because God's purpose for them is different. And in that um, original pattern of creation, we see how everything was made to work together in harmony, in dependence upon one another. There is something incredibly interlinked and complex about the world. And we are all part of that. We're not just isolated individuals. We are part of of this created world that reflects God's glory. And God has a purpose for human beings at the heart of this creation. We read in verse 19 that the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. The sons of God there is a way of referring to Christians, to people who have trusted Christ in whom the Spirit dwells come more to this in a moment, but the future of creation is linked to God's purpose for his people. So at one level, human beings are part of creation. We are creatures. We are living beings like the animals. But we are also different to the animals. We are different because we are made as God's image. 
to sharing God's rule over creation. In that way, we are not the same as any other species. That's why we care about the animals. We care about their future. We get concerned when we find a beached whale or something. Beached whales don't have any concern for our future. There's no other animals that worry about the future of the planet or global warming or anything else. We are different. God has given us that place of rule. And he's given us enormous significance in his purpose. And that is such a contrast to the, uh, some of the environmental doctrine we have today that is utterly anti-human. Because in many ways, the best thing that you can do for the environment, we're told, is to die. Human beings are the problem. Um, even just um, last month, this great headline here concerning uh, David Attenborough's uh, new program on dinosaurs, humanity's impact like the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. Okay, so... Here's this mass extinction devastation event in the past. What's humanity? Well, we're basically like that. We're the cause of devastation. We are the problem. Well, there's an element of truth in that, as we shall see. But the answer is not our non-existence. The answer is uh, discovering our true existence in Jesus Christ. You see, we don't need to be um, guilty for existing. God has given us a job to do. So let's look now at the problem with creation. He talks about it as a creation, Paul talks here about it, the creation being subjected to frustration. It's a creation that is groaning A creation that is in this bondage to decay. He's telling us that something, it tells us what what we actually can all see for ourselves, that something is wrong. The world isn't functioning as intended. And here we see the true measure of our significance as human beings. It's human sin that has caused the problem. Not our existence. It's our disobedience to God. And it all comes in with the very first man, Adam. As he turns from God, as he turns from the author of life, death enters creation. We see God's judgment on creation. That's what, God is, what Paul is talking about here in verse 20, um, about the, the creation subjected to frustration by the will of the one who subjected it. This is talking about God's judgment upon the world. That is the reason our bodies decay. That is why there is disease. That is why it is hard to grow food and that there are pests and disasters. Some of the harmony of creation is broken. Creation isn't functioning as God originally made. That's what this word frustration means. It's it's really the word for futility. There's something ineffective about it. It's not fulfilling its true purpose. It's a bit like when Jesus curses the fig tree, as we were um, last week or or recently thinking about. Well, something's gone wrong with the fig tree because it's not producing fruit. Its purpose is to produce fruit, but it's not doing that. And we sort of see that in creation as a whole. It's in this, what Paul calls bondage to decay, this state of corruption. And that's a, a sort of condition that creation is in, but our sin continues to damage creation. Look at uh, what the prophet Hosea says, talking about life in Israel at the same time as as, as Amos. There is only cursing, lying and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land mourns and all who live in it waste away. The beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea are dying. Well, it sounds very contemporary, doesn't it? But see the connection there. 
between the sin of people and the effect and the implications on creation. And so many environmental problems come very directly from human sin. So creation is a sort of this defaced masterpiece, like the Mona Lisa I was showing before. It's like a ruined castle where you can see something of its original glory. You see that as you look at creation. But you can also see that it is spoiled. It is not how it's meant to be. And I think one of the reasons that God has done this to the world is to show us that something is wrong. There's something very tangible about it, isn't it? That the physical suffering we see in creation... God is sending us this message that this is what happens when you turn from the God who is good, the God who is the giver of life. This is the effects of it. So we see something of the seriousness of sin. When you just think of the the degree of suffering around the world today, you look at, yes, our decaying bodies. That is showing the seriousness of sin. This isn't how it's meant to be. Death is a terrible evil, and it's the great ultimate futility, isn't it? That however great a life you live, however um, impressive whatever achievements, it always ends in death. And when life is cut short, that's something, that is the ultimate futility, isn't it? And God is saying that is a fruit of sin. Creation is in, is in bondage. It's not, so in other words, there's not freedom here. You don't get freedom from rebelling against God. There's no freedom when we are not fulfilling our purpose. As we rebel against God, we don't get freedom. We're actually in this state of of bondage. And that's what we see in the world. There is a problem to be fixed. But if evolution is true, if we got where we are today simply through billions of years of random events, there is nothing to be fixed. You know, whether it's human carbon emissions, plastic in the ocean... Well, that's no more a problem to be fixed than dinosaur predators or or their extinction, for that matter. It's just another event in the history of the world. It's just another thing that another species on the planet does. You see, environmentalism assumes a purpose, somehow what creation ought to be like. But where does that come from? It makes no sense unless you're coming at it from this perspective from God, from the Bible. You see, what we find here in the Bible is something rather different. Our our care for the environment is fulfilling a purpose. We should be caring for this world. It's about getting closer to what God originally intended. Again, there's an analogy with our bodies. Why do we... You you could say, well, look, our bodies are decaying. They're going to die in the end. Why bother? Why bother with health care? And yet, we do bother with health care, and we're right to bother with health care. Because we are seeking to repair, if you like, the damage that's been done. We're trying to get closer to the original pattern. The problem is we can only ever do so much. We can only really slow some of the process. However good health care you have, you still die in the end. You cannot get back to paradise. We cannot do that ourselves. We need God to do something. And it's exactly the same for the planet. There's things we can and should do, but they will always be limited. You see, the creation here is is groaning in its present suffering. It's groaning, it's not moaning. It's groaning in hope. Note the analogy Paul gives of childbirth. It's groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Well, in childbirth, you're not moaning that a child is coming. You're groaning in the pain of it. 
but in eager expectation of the child that is coming. If you like, you're groaning in the knowledge that it will soon be over, that the pain is for a purpose. It's not just something meaningless. The end of the pain is a child. A new life will arrive. And that's exactly what God is promising the creation. He is promising a rebirth. There's a creation awaiting redemption. The whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The future of creation is linked to the future of our bodies. We've heard of the idea of gender dysphoria. Well, as Christians, we suffer from body dysphoria. If you like, there's a mismatch between our new spiritual condition in Christ. We have eternal life. We are new people in Christ. There's a mismatch between that and our decaying bodies. And we groan because we're still in this sinful world with sin corrupted bodies. We're waiting for the, so if you like, for that mismatch to be put right. So what is the answer? Is it to escape our bodies and go to a spiritual existence in heaven? No, it's not. That's pretty much what every other religion says. That isn't the answer we see in Christ, is it? He has a new body, a resurrection body, a body that's been redeemed. The Jesus that was resurrected was recognizably the same person that had died. There's a continuity. And so the same with the bodies of Christians. Our bodies will be transformed to bodies without disease or death or decay. It will be a new form of physical life. When Jesus comes again, he will remake the whole of creation. What we see in his coming in the first time, when he heals people, when he stills the storm, when he, he provides abundant food, this is all pictures of, of what he will do in a final and complete way when he comes again. Creation will be redeemed. It will be bought back. It will be restored to match and indeed exceed the goodness of the original creation. The great promise in Revelation 21 is a creation where there is no more death or crying or pain. And this will be a, a transformation of creation, not a sort of making new from nothing. God is starting with the creation as it is, and he's restoring it. He's not doing a new build. You see, if God was to simply just get rid of creation and start again, it would be giving up on what he had made. But that isn't what he does. He redeems creation. Maybe some of you are um, thinking of those verses in 2 Peter 3 where it talks about the world being destroyed by fire. Does that contradict what I'm saying here? I don't think so. The fire there is a fire of purification. And when you're trying to restore something, you have to get rid of the damaged and decaying bits, don't you? Just as God did in the flood. There was an element of destruction, but it was in order to transform the world into a new type of world. He's not starting from scratch. It's a little bit like restoring a building. I've sometimes used the analogy of this chapel. Um, if you look at what this looked like in 1993 and what it looks like today... There's been a lot of stuff that's been thrown out, a lot of stuff that's been destroyed, but it's been transformed. It's still recognizably the same building, and yet it is very different, and it's a bit like that with creation. So the, the bottom line is here that it is God who saves the planet. It is part of his work of saving people. It is by the death and resurrection of the perfect man, Jesus Christ, 
that the damage of our sin is undone, including the damage in creation. So to be part of that, to be part of this new future, to know um, your sins forgiven, to be enjoying this perfectly functioning creation in the future, you need to trust in Christ now. This whole glorious future of creation comes with Christ and only with Christ. So if you like creation, what's creation waiting for? It's waiting for all God's people to turn to Christ. So the most ecologically significant thing you can do, the greenest thing you could ever do, is to become a Christian. That's what creation is waiting for. And when you do that, it will change how you live. A spirit-filled life is a life that I believe will want to care for creation. And just as we finish, I'm just going to try and give some particular applications to this, um, these sort of environmental issues. Some examples of where this sort of biblical view of creation should shape the way that we live. And I would stress that all of this stuff is very complicated because we're in a very complicated creation where everything is interlinked, where, where what happens to one thing affects something else and affects something else. So you can try and fix one problem and you're in danger of creating one somewhere else. It's a little bit like, again, with our bodies. We, um, you, know, you take medicine for one problem, but there's side effects, aren't there, that can then create another problem. And it's a little bit like that, I think, in our care of the environment, which is why there isn't always one right answer and why we need wisdom, why we need to learn from one another. So here's one example, biodiversity. In evolution, extinction is just what happens. It's a fact of life. That's just the way things work. For a Christian, it's a loss of something that God has made. God originally filled the world with every possible type of creature. All sorts of different ways they reflect God's glory. So to lose that is a great loss. We're losing something of the display of God's glory. And again, look at Noah as an example. Noah was a lot greener than Greta. He was the greatest environmentalist ever. He's inc- if there's one person I'd love to meet, if you could be a sort of historical figure, it would be Noah. He spans the ages. And he was an incredible person because he used technology to preserve all kinds of life. He preserved the, diversi- the biodiversity of the planet through that boat that he built. And, he's, and, it, and when he's doing that boat, he's using um, renewable resources that are biodegradable. Again, he couldn't be greener. Great example of someone who cared for the planet. Biodiversity, we should also care for animal welfare. And again, in evolution, animal suffering is just how it is. That's just how evolution proceeds. Animals suffer. In a biblical understanding, animal suffering and death is a result of human sin. Animal pain matters. We should be, as Christians, at the forefront of caring for animals well. I think it is shocking that, as Christians, we have somehow let this all go out to the non-Christian world and been actually quite suspicious of animal welfare. That is ridiculous. We're the people that can um, truly stand for for care of animals. Did you know that William Wilberforce, he's known for his um, anti-slavery work, but he also founded the RSPCA. The two are not in contradiction. The two actually go together. Animal welfare should be a care, a concern of Christians. Pollution. God's made the world with with boundaries, with order. God separates the sea and the land. God separates the day and the night. And we see God is constantly ordering things to be in their proper place. And when we find what, what is dirt, well, dirt is stuff in the wrong place. Soil in your garden is fine in your house, at least in our culture, is not. 
And we actually see this in Old Testament laws, laws about cleanliness. They're about having things in their right place. And I think there's a real application of that in, in pollution today. You know, there is a place for oil. There is a place for plastic. I don't think it's in the oceans. We should care about that. What about global warming? Well, I don't want to detain you for another hour, so um, let me just be very quick on this. I do believe it's a real thing. I don't think this is some sort of conspiracy that's been dreamt up. But it is something that is complicated. And in a biblical understanding, there's actually been loads of climate change, very rapid climate change in human history. Since the flood, the climate has changed massively. We actually see evidence of that in Scripture itself. Maybe the earth is more resilient to these things than some of the scientists assume. But again, as we seek to find solutions to this, let's be careful not to fixate on one problem and in doing so create others. You know, we, we all move to, to electric, okay, but what are then the environmental effects of all the cobalt mining or everything else that's going to be involved? There are side effects. And again, when we are sort of fixated on, on one issue without looking at the other environmental impacts, we're going to get into problems. And I think that the biggest lesson of this is, is that it's a reminder of our limitations. Just as we can't do whatever we like with our bodies, you can't just eat and drink whatever you like with no consequences. You can't just work and work and go without sleep. You collapse. Our bodies are limited. God's made us like that, made us dependent. Well, it's exactly the same with the planet. We can't just do whatever we like. We can't just take and take and take. That isn't how God has made us. We are actually dependent upon God. And I think there are, so there are consequences for, what we, are, for what, we, what we take out of the world unnecessarily. Impact on the poor. The poor are disproportionately affected by environmental damage. Often it is they who lose their homes in storms or their crops or live next to toxic waste or pollution. You know, you can think, well, why should I care about the pollution of my car? Well, maybe if you live out in the countryside far away from any motorways, you're probably not going to care. If you live next to the North Circular, it is going to be something that bothers you. And that is something that should bother us all, the impact on the poor. But finally, is this not a challenge to our consumerism today? You see, the problem is not so much population growth, but what we all consume. How much waste do we have? How much food do we waste? Clothes do we waste? How much travel is unnecessary? How many gadgets? You know, do we always have to have the newest everything? Often the, some of the green policies are actually about trying to maintain the same lifestyle rather than about making do with less. We need to come back to Jesus' words. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do we need to learn contentment? But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Well, you know, as Christians, we can be content. We can be content because we have Christ. He gives us everything. He promises to meet our needs. And he gives us a new creation to look forward to. And if that has raised questions, things you want to ask about, feel free to um, do that with me. Um, there's even a question box there you can use as well, and maybe that's something we can address in some of our afternoon meetings in days to come. But let's, let's finish um, with this, uh, this song about creation. Creation sings the Father's song. We find in verse 2, 
a second Adam, that's Jesus Christ, walked the earth whose blameless life would break the curse. And then in verse 3, when he renews the land and sky, all heaven will sing and earth reply. Let's stand and sing together. in prayer. We thank you that we can sing the praise of creation's king. We pray that each one of us would truly bow in our hearts before him, that we would submit to the rule of Jesus Christ, that we would turn to him, that we would look to him for forgiveness for new life, and for this hope for the future. Lord, help us in this task you've given us as your image, as your sort of co- co-ruler over this world. You've given us such a, an honoured position to rule over this world that you have made. May we do that in a way that honours our creator, that honours our saviour, that uses the wisdom that you have given to us, that uses the, the expertise that you have provided and that also recognises our limitations, that recognises our dependence upon you, that recognises that only you in the end can save the planet. Heavenly Father, may we turn to you and trust you and may you help us to, to walk with you and obey you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>